Well, good morning, folks. Thank you very much for um, dropping in this morning. If you've done one of our sessions before, uh, thank you for that. Uh, plus, uh, I should have warned you, uh, we just got an improved camera, so you're going to have to suffer through uh, a better view of me during uh, the following sessions. And um, I'm Joe Long. You are uh, joining us for the Relic Room's Heroes on Zoom series. And what we're doing in this series, uh, and I'm trying to keep these to about 20 minutes after promising 15, is going through a wonderful, wonderful old book. This is my copy, Hero Tales. Um, you can find this book if you want to follow along with us. Um, free online in a variety of places. It also remains in print, even though it was first published in 1895. And the idea of Hero Tales was to uh, have short essays for young people on great events and great characters in American history, specifically uh, with the idea of showing them what it meant to be an American and teaching leadership lessons along the way. And a unique thing about Hero Tales is that it's a story of stories of American heroes by a pair of American heroes. Um, you may not recognize one of these gentlemen, Henry Cabot Lodge, a tremendous statesman, but the other might be familiar to you from Mount Rushmore, and that is none other than Theodore Roosevelt himself. So we're getting advice and insights about American heroes from American heroes. Uh, and I think that that's a privilege and one for us to enjoy. So today's lesson is on the Battle of Bennington. And that's an unusual choice in a way because much more um, focused on in history usually is the Battle of Saratoga, which would come not long after Bennington and was a much larger fight. So whenever you're looking at history uh, or when you're looking at news, there are so many stories to tell, it's worth asking yourself, why are they telling this one? And Roosevelt and Lodge are pretty upfront about why they're telling this story of the Battle of Bennington. If you were with us last time, we talked about Trenton, where George Washington triumphed um, using clever strategy and great initiative. Now, Washington's victory has, has made a difference. And part of the difference is an alliance with France. And the strategic situation is changing, but it's going to be the Battle of Saratoga that really turns the tide. Yet the Battle of Saratoga, which they skip in Hero Tales, is brought about largely by success at this smaller fight earlier at Bennington. And the man who leads the troops at Bennington is John Stark. Uh, and here's an image of John Stark. One of the most um, important formative things about him, he had been the second in command of the elite unit known as Rogers Rangers in the French and Indian War. Uh, that was where his military experience was from. And that was a very good resume. The other thing about John Stark, his quote appears on every uh, New Hampshire license plate these days. The quote, to live free or die, came from a letter that he wrote in later years to a veteran's reunion. Uh, the full quote, in fact, was, live free or die, death is not the worst of evils. So let's 
take a closer look at this fellow Stark. Um, John Stark was appropriately a strong man, a strong personality. Stark is actually the German word for strong. And perhaps when the Hessian mercenaries who would fight at Bennington learned who was commanding the opposite army, um, that, that name Stark might have made a, an impression on them. Um, he, was a, he was a tough fellow, to say the least. Rogers Rangers was an elite unit that operated far behind enemy lines. And at one point in that earlier war on the frontier, uh, Stark had actually been captured by the Abenaki Indians, uh, which was potentially a, a, not just a death sentence, but a death by torture sentence. But while captured, he managed to warn the rest of the party he was with, so that his brother, also in Rogers Rangers, and others could get away. Uh, he was brought back to an Abenaki village um, by his courage. Uh, rather than being tortured to death, he wound up being adopted uh, and having foster parents in the Abenaki tribe. Uh, he would escape, return to service with Rogers Rangers, served bravely and well, rising to second in command, and then Rogers planned a deep behind the lines assault on an Abenaki village. And this happened to be the one his foster parents lived in. And uh, Stark simply but defiantly refused to go along on that expedition. And we're going to see that his strong personality affects a lot of his career. In fact, in the next war in the American Revolution, veterans of Rogers Rangers were much in demand. They were the expert frontier fighters. And so he's quickly welcomed into the Continental Army and given a commission. Uh, he fights very bravely, particularly at Bunker Hill. Uh, and that is a, a battle that was legendary for American bravery. And he's an outstanding officer at Bunker Hill. And a little bit later in his military career for the Continental Army, he is sent on a recruiting mission. Now, this is very important. Uh, we were hearing about how hard George Washington had to work to keep the numbers of the army up and how the, the troops tended to fade away to go back to their farms and businesses and take care of their families. And it was, uh, it was a continuous challenge. But while he was away on a recruiting mission, a man he considered an incompetent was promoted over his head. And Stark resigned from the Continental Army. This was disgusting. This was incompetence. He wasn't going to put up with this. He wasn't changing sides or anything. But he was going to go home and not fight again, except in command of uh, New Hampshire militia. So we're talking about a pretty difficult human being. But his leadership is going to be critical in charge of New Hampshire militia at that Battle of Bennington. Now, let me move to the discussion that Lodge and Roosevelt give us of that particular battle. Um, what's happening is an attempt by the British to sweep down and cut off the New England states from the rest of the American colonies. Uh, they have overwhelming force to do so with, but a critical advance party that's being sent ahead is met by um, Stark's militia. At first, all went well, that is, for the British. The Americans were pushed back from their posts. By the end of July, Burgoyne was at the headwaters of the Hudson and had sent out a force to take possession of the Valley of the Mohawk. To aid that force by a diversion, and also to capture certain magazines, that is, um, uh, armament storage places, 
that were reported to be at Bennington, Burgoyne sent another expedition to the eastward. This is the one Stark's going to fight against. It's not a huge force, and this is not a huge battle. And just like we saw from George Rogers Clark two sessions ago, small forces in a small fight can actually be very critical to the big picture. This force consisted of about 550 white troops, chiefly Hessians, German mercenaries, and 150 Indians, all under the command of Colonel Baum. They were within four miles of Bennington on August 13, 1777, encamped on a hill. Well, Stark, typically for him, uh, he's raised a pretty big militia force and begins his campaign here, his, his battle at Bennington, by disregarding orders. He's been ordered to rejoin the main American army, the one which he had resigned from. He's no longer a Continental officer, and he says he won't answer to them anymore. He's got his own ideas, and he marches at once to meet Baum instead. He's within a mile of the British camp on August 14th. On the 15th, it rained heavily, and the British occupied their time entrenching themselves strongly on a hill. So now they've got their high ground, and they are fortified. He's also sent for reinforcements. The weather cleared, Stark determined to attack. Early in the day, he sent men under Nichols and Herrick to get into the rear of Baum's position. The German officer, ignorant of the country and of the nature of the warfare in which he was engaged, noticed small bodies of men in their shirt sleeves, carrying guns without bayonets, making their way to the rear of his entrenchments. Baum sees these guys probably in there hunting shirts like mine. They have weapons without bayonets. Now what that means is they're not professional soldiers. And they're just waltzing along, strolling around the hill that he's on. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I pointed out my hunting shirt without changing the camera. This is uh, something some of y'all got to look up earlier with the terrible camera, but you'll get a better look at the hunting shirt here. In any case, he sees guys in civilian clothing, not uniforms. They're carrying civilian weapons. That's what the part without bayonets means. It means, uh, you know, it's, it's ordinary weapons not issued by an army. And he just ignores this. Uh, they must be loyalists. They're loyal citizens of the king coming to help us defend against the American militia. Um, this is unbelievable naivete, but maybe just the chutzpah of walking past, fully armed, in full view of the British troops and taking up a position in their rear, nobody would do that. Just walk around to the enemy, because these, of course, are among Stark's men. And he surrounds this entire hill. A little editorializing here by the authors, with singular stupidity. He concluded they were Tory inhabitants who were coming to his assistance. He made no attempt to stop them. Stark was enabled to mass about 500 men in the rear of the enemy's position. Distracting the attention of the British by a feint, he also moved about 200 men to the right. And having brought all of his forces into position, he ordered a general assault, and the Americans proceeded to storm the British entrenchments on every side. The fight was a very hot one and lasted some two hours. Well, this is going to be a very successful fight for the Americans. Stark reports at the end of the battle, 14 killed on his side and 42 men wounded. Of Baum's 374 professional soldiers, German mercenaries, only nine men escaped. So, Stark lost 14 men. Baum had only nine men left. And this was a tremendous victory, and it's going to set up the victory to come at Saratoga. But what are the lessons? And you can read more about it in the account itself. What are the lessons to be drawn from 
the life of um, John Stark and his selection in Hero Tales and the, the story of this Battle of Bennington. Well, here's some things we have in common with what we looked at with George Washington at Trenton. And uh, the first one really has been emphasized every character so far in Hero Tales. Roosevelt has emphasized they became strong through growing up on the frontier and facing many hardships. They sought difficult challenges and they survived them and prevailed through them. So that's a common thing we've seen in all the American hero tales so far in the story. Even George Washington, they emphasized the time he spent on the frontier and what the wilderness did for him. The next thing is the Cincinnatus idea. And the Cincinnatus idea referred specifically to a Roman dictator um, put into place for an emergency in Rome. That's what dictators were for back then, to meet an emergency. And then having won the battle, he resigned and went home. And we saw this in George Washington as well. It was emphasized that um, although he could have seized power at the end of the war, he did not do that. He believed the right thing to do was to go home. Now, Stark is called the true Cincinnatus because Washington did go back into politics eventually. Uh, Cincinnatus, or, uh, Stark did not. The rest of his life, he would live out quietly as a farmer. He had won his battle. Uh, he helped to win the war itself, and then he went home. And that's really looked at as, as a virtue compared to so many other nations where military success also meant seizing control of the government in some way. We also talked about with George Washington at Trenton, total commitment. Um, once he had chosen the correct path to take in challenging the British uh, at Trenton and at Princeton, George Washington, um, there was no room to vacillate. Once the correct short, uh, course was chosen, he risked all and put everything into it. Well, we're seeing that very much also from Stark. He has complete commitment, both at Bunker Hill, at Bennington, and as well in his most famous quote after the war that's held up as um, sort of the, the summary of his message, live free or die. In fact, there's some stark, excuse me, couldn't help it, stark differences between him and Washington, and one of them has to do with strategy. The way that Roosevelt puts it is almost demeaning. It was not a battle in which either military strategy or scientific management of troops was displayed. All that Stark did was place his men so they could attack the enemy's position on every side. And then the Americans went at it, firing as they pressed on. The British and Germans stood their ground stubbornly. The New England farmers rushed up within eight yards of the cannon and picked off the men who manned the guns. Stark himself was in the midst of the fray fighting with his soldiers and came out of the conflict so blackened with powder and smoke that he could hardly be recognized. No clever strategy here. But a lack of clever strategy from this really experienced veteran, this lack of clever strategy from Stark is the best strategy available because of the nature of his troops. He knows their limitations. Uh, and as another author put it, Stark had a rare and priceless quality. He knew the limitations of his men. They really hadn't been trained. They just had their civilian weapons. Their discipline was lousy. Uh, they definitely didn't want to get shot. And yet with these men, he would win this lopsided victory, killing over 200 vaunted European regulars, capturing a bunch more. Again, only nine men got away from this, and he only lost 14. So in a way, it's 
not great strategy because he didn't do anything fancy. But this very experienced and wise officer used his troops to do what they were good at. And by using his troops to do what they were good at and using their, their willingness and even their inexperience, even, even their chutzpah, that they would just walk past the British to go ahead and get back in back of them, um, these things actually make the whole thing work. Uh, another Stark difference, of course, is that Stark has had a problem with the Continental Army. He's not happy with the high leadership, and he's actually protested that by resigning. So an interesting guy, a strong personality, uh, and certainly a worthy addition into the American hero tales. Uh, and just to mention it, uh, and hopefully none of the vandals uh, are watching my videos here, uh, but there is a great statue and a wonderful monument to Stark at the site of the Battle of Benton, uh, uh, the Battle of Bennington. Uh, this is a 306 foot tall battle monument with his statue in front of it. And in 1945, his quote, live free or die was officially adopted as the motto of the great state of New Hampshire. Now, as usual, I've run more than five minutes over time. There's so much rich material in these stories. Uh, I hope that you will join me on Tuesday as we return to the South uh, and to what's a local fight for us South Carolinians, and that's the battle at Zeus Mountain. <laughs>